Valerie. How are you today? I'm good, Kim. So nice to meet you. So nice to meet you too. How's your day going so far? It's going well. It's going well. So I, my kids are done school. They're in the French school board. So they finished a week before everybody else. Oh. So it's just, you know, working from home, adjusting to this new daily schedule. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Um, So you're a mind body life coach and a certified athletic therapist. That's correct. correct. Okay. So maybe you can start by talking about your background, what led you to helping people with neuroplastic pain, and also explain what that is. Yes, absolutely. So uh, by trade, I'm a certified athletic therapist um, in, in the States, because you're, you, I know you're, you live in the United States. Yes. Um, athletic therapists are I think more known as athletic trainers. So we have a uh, undergraduate degree that specializes in uh, the assessment and treatment of orthopedic injuries. So any injuries that are related to bones, muscles, and ligaments, our specialty is very much with athletes. However, we treat anybody. It's just our treatment style is based on a sports medicine model. So we're also uh, sports first responders. You'll mo you chances are you're going to see athletic therapists uh, working with sports teams. So let's say the NHL or NFL, this is at the higher level, the, the, the man or the woman that's running on field when there's injuries, most of them are athletic therapists. So that's our specialty, but we also work in clinics. Um, and, and for over, uh, 10 years, I've owned my own practice, private practice as well, where I treat anybody from kids to elderly okay. pre or post-operative, uh, surgeries, concussion. Uh, so that's been really my background. And then, uh, and then you, and you called yourself a sports first responder. I've so the, that. yeah, sports first responder is the, is the certification we have. So we're oh. first responders, but we specialize in sports, meaning we can actually, uh, for example, if there's a hockey player that hurts himself and we're suspecting a spinal injury, we're trained to remove the sports equipment on ice in order to put the athlete on a spinal board. So it's really our specialty. Um, and wow. same with football. Yeah. So any emergency care when it comes to sports, that's our jam. <laughs> And that's again on field, but then when when we go into the clinic, we treat any uh, musculoskeletal injuries. Okay, all right. Mm -hmm. I didn't mean to interrupt. Continue. No, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then I did a bit of a career shift. I mean, I'm still uh, a certified athletic therapist, but I actually no longer work in the clinic. I'm now a full time uh, mind body life coach. I got, uh, and that honestly happened through my own personal healing and journey. <laughs> I discovered oh, this. Okay, yeah. <laughs> tell us about that. Well, if, um, so I personally um, suffered with chronic migraines and headaches and tension, neck pain, uh, as well as IBS issues for quite, for as long as I can remember, to be honest. Um, but about over seven years ago, uh, there was a year of really big contrast in my life. I experienced, um, a, so I gave birth to my second daughter and uh, experienced some significant hemorrhage postpartum. And that put me back for a few weeks. And then four months after she was born, I was diagnosed with melanoma. So skin cancer oh. on, on one of my breast of all places, oh. <laughs> which was really shocking because, um, well, A, I was like, okay, this is not a skin, a, a part of the body that gets exposed to the sun. Right. And B, I mean, I was still nursing. So oh. uh, thank goodness I didn't have to go through radiation or chemo. They really were able to clear all the margins through uh, removing, you know, a big chunk of the skin. But it was such a big, yeah, unpleasant recovery. <laughs> I know, I know. Um, and that really kind of put me back a little bit. I was really in a, in a big shock. And then uh, four months after that, uh, my marriage of 17 years unexpectedly s dissolved. <laughs> so oh. it was a lot of, uh, I guess you could say, 
trauma, you know, physical, just a lot of emotional challenges in that one year. And yeah, sure enough, all in one year, all in one oh. year. Yeah. I had two daughters. So my second daughter, yes. Yeah, so, and my oldest daughter was five years old at the time and I was still running a business. So you're just trying oh. to survive, you know, keep your business going. <laughs> And I was just that type of personality. You keep going, you know, I, I'm, I'm fine. It's just, just keep on trucking. You're and sure, yeah, well, on the outside, right, it really did perceive that way. Um, but you know, my symptoms really took a turn. It my migraines got worse, my IBS issues got worse. I can imagine. And, yep. And uh, I actually discovered uh, Brooke Castillo, which you would know uh, through a podcast, and I fell in love with her teaching and 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 uh, I it really helped me get out of this, you know, circumstances that these challenges that I was going through. And so I decided to get certified a mostly for my own personal growth, but B, I thought, you know what, I can I'm sure one day I'll I'll, I'll put it to use and I'll be able to help people. And at the same time, I dove into mind body medicine because of my health issues. And I connected some major dots there. Yes. I realized, which I, you know, considering my background as an athletic therapist, I never really understood what the real science of pain was. Right. Okay. And, and cause you're so, I mean, it's all, we're all trained by the conventional medical system and there's a way of thinking. So when I realized that pain is actually produced in the brain and not in the body, and that the emotions and stresses has plays a huge role into this. I, I started asking myself questions like, what if what I'm experiencing is really a mind, their mind body syndromes or my or neuroplastic pain? Because I had gone through the the medical route of seeing uh, doctors, specialists, I had an MRI done of my brain, nobody could figure out why I was experiencing migraines. And uh, the only causes to that was I'm getting close to my 40s. It must be hormonal, <laughs> premenopausal, which is a common cause we hear. Yes. And when it came to IBS was food intolerance. So uh, I was told eggs were actually a, 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 a common uh, food allergy for migraines. So I removed eggs and wheat and dairy out of my oh, that's diet. So and Oh, the, the frustration and the, and the fear just, just got worse, to be honest. So um, that's when, when I dove into the mind body mess, I realized that that was the issue. So I started to implement these tools and strategies on me and well, little did we know that was the actual solution. And I no longer suffer from migraines at all. And you can like, bring I, all your food back. I am. I'm oh. now back into eating wheat and dairy and eggs and uh, my levels of stress have gone down because I don't fear, you know, the pain and I don't fear these foods anymore because I realize they're actually healthy for me. It was just my nervous system was very much dysregulated. Wow. Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so, so your migraines are gone. Yes. So I, um, so I actually resolved, uh, my migraines. I do once in a while will still experience headaches, but the most changing aspect of all this is before, you know, and that's the most common reaction of most people is when we experience pain is we ask ourselves, okay, well, what did I eat? What did I do wrong? You know, is there, we, we find it an external cause. So is, yes. is it going to rain soon? Right. Some people with migraines, they say, oh, it must be the pressure in the air that's changing. Yes. <laughs> must be hormonals. Like there's all yes. these external reasons. That's right. So I don't do that anymore. I immediately go within. So when I experience a headache and tension, I go within and I will ask myself, okay, well, what am I experiencing right now? And I, I tell you a hundred percent of the time, it's always emotional. So oh, there are emotions really? that were suppressed in my body that I didn't know I had. And my body was simply trying to tell me I'm sensing a lot of danger here because of my fear. And so the emotion of fear is the emotion that will perpetuate chronic pain, including migraines, including any other physical symptoms. And fear can come across as anxiety, as stress, as worry, as frustration, 
anger, those are all emotions that have the underlying tone of fear. So your brain will perceive that as danger and it will make sure it communicates that with you by sending you physical pain. It's as simple as that. Wow. So if you get a headache, just a sudden headache, that comes from fear. Well, fear, and it's fear, it, like, like fear that's happening before the headache comes or fear from the past or uh, it's you now that I've really so in order to do this work, and that's what I teach my students in my program is we got to first become aware of what what are some of the common beliefs you might have. And so much so many of our thoughts and beliefs are subconscious. And what most people aren't aware is it's our thinking that's causing how we feel. So instead of looking at external causes, right, to what is causing my fear, I go within and I'm, I'm, I will be either looking at, okay, well, what am I thinking that's causing me some worry, some stress, some fear, and then I'm able to address that and allow my body to process the emotion. But one of the biggest thing that was such a life-changing um, piece of information I learned was and that can perpetuate fear their personality traits and this is where was it was a light bulb for me so there's research that have shown that people that have personality traits such as perfectionism people pleasing <laughs> conscientiousness or anxiety that when it gets to a point where it dominates your day will definitely put your nervous system and in your and your brain into this quote unquote danger state. Okay. So because of what I have, I'm a, a, a bit of a perfectionist. I have both a, some perfectionism and people pleasing, and I can be really hard on myself. So, yeah. you know, when we're hard on ourselves and we criticize ourselves and we judge ourselves, that is enough to create like for me was pressure in my head. It was causing headaches and migraines for me because I was not giving myself love, accepting how I would be, you know, at a certain point or giving myself compassion. And uh, that's what has been the biggest change for me is viewing myself differently. That's so interesting. Mm -hmm. So if I get a headache next time, I don't get that. I'm, no, I'm not usually in pain anywhere in my body, but sometimes I do get headaches. So would I just say, would I just start asking myself questions? You know, what am I, wh I like, what would you say to yourself? Yeah. So what I would do, like the, the, the biggest thing I have people do is to maybe grab like a journal or, you know, somewhere, just a, 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 I mean, you can do it on a piece of paper, but I'm a big fan. Journaling is a great way to create self-awareness. Yes, so you can ask yourself the questions like, how, how do you tend to react in life? So when there's circumstances, how do you tend to react are your reactions and behaviors based more from fear or are they love-based, right? Because those are the two dominant feelings we feel on a daily yeah. basis. And, and if you're noticing you tend to, to lean towards the fear, then go deeper. You know, you can ask yourself like when, <clears throat> I mean, you can maybe notice first if there's a pattern um, of, you know, whether it's something you're doing or not doing that you're noticing will trigger your headaches. Um, it, and sometimes they're <laughs> random. I know sometimes they're just so random. We don't even pay attention, but that's a, a pure sign that your nervous system is dysregulated. And that's why it'll keep sending you messages just randomly because it doesn't know what's happening. Yeah. So I think just becoming aware of some beliefs and thoughts you might have about your headaches, about you, about how you do, how you you perform and how you behave. Like what does that what does that look like? I would maybe start yeah. there. Um and then let me ask you what do you do when you do get the headaches? What's your reaction? What do you do? What do I do? Oh my gosh. Well, I complain. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Um, I think I go and I drink some tea mm -hmm. or I just say, well, or I, or I actually sometimes like I woke up with a headache, but I think it's because we didn't have enough air in the room mm -hmm. and I said, I'm going to go exercise, which I do anyway. Like nothing stops me from exercising, but I go, it'll go away. 
when I start exercising and breathe in and it does. Yeah. But, and but sometimes it's, it really hurts. So I'll go lie down and, you know, try to be away from light and yeah, I, I think I just, a lot of times just go about my normal day mm -hmm. and just suffer. <laughs> I don't like and, to take anything. Right. I usually don't. Yeah. And the most common reactions we do when we experience pain will, well, the first one is we try and fix it, right? What can I do to try and fix it? So right. either by taking a medication, drinking tea, putting yeah. a hot pack or cold pack, like we try and do something, stretch our neck, we will do something to try and fix it. Sometimes we avoid it, right? We pretend it's not there, hoping it's going to go away. Sometimes we push through it. Yeah. If I just keep pushing through it, it's going to go away eventually. Yeah. Um, those are all some of the reactions we tend to do, but, but it actually perpetuates your pain even more okay. because what, what the message it sends to your brain is you are in danger because you're trying to do some, something about it. Right. Right. So your brain keeps thinking, okay, you keep trying to fix it because the emotion is fear driven, right? Right. Yeah. And it's only perpetuating the pain, even going to bed. And that's something I used to do when I had my migraines were so bad, like I would have to take a gravel and just sleep it off. And it sometimes would even work. But when we yeah, go into it's really a, painful, it is, I migraine. know, like you can't yeah. function. Yeah, it's it's they're they're pretty debilitating. So when we go into a dark room, and it's quiet, we're actually, again, telling our brain, okay, I'm in danger. So I'm really going to keep myself small and protect myself even more. So it's only perpetuating the same message because that's our brain's primitive job is to keep you safe. Our brain's designed yeah. to keep you safe. And that's why we tend to focus on the negative and on the fear based as opposed to the positive and the love based emotions. I don't know if you've noticed that just every day, right? When you, when we watch the news, everything's negative. Oh, We're just so drawn yes, to it. Yes. Yeah. So our brain will, will tend to focus on that more. So when we behave that way, it does continuously send that message. So what one of the best tools, tools that I teach, and that was designed by a couple of doctors in the States a few years ago, is called somatic tracking. It's a form of a meditation that you do when you experience pain. And the purpose of it is to reframe your relationship with pain so that when you feel pain, you're just observing it. You're not trying to fix it. You're not trying to judge it. You're allowing it to be there. But instead, you're kind of being more curious about it. You're like, huh, okay, I'm experiencing pain. I'm feeling it. And then you can describe it. What really helps is describing it. I'm feeling a lot of pressure. It's tight. It's sharp. Whatever the words you want to use. Yeah. Um, and then you let it be. You breathe through it. That's kind of that, like anxiety, right? Like when yes. You, it's the same thing for anxiety. Same principle. Yeah. And pain is an emo like we can experience emotional pain and physical pain. The way we address it is the same. Okay. And so what happens is now the brain will start sensing that you're calm. You're seeing it as not a dangerous thing. In fact, you're very much safe because you are. I mean, the, the, the pain is just a sensation. Right, it is. So you are safe and the brain will then start to lessen the sensation and lessen your pain. That's how, okay. and that's how it works. Yeah. So it's to really reprogram your brain with your thinking with your emotions, using these mind body tools so that your brain perceives pain as safety and not danger. So that's really the, the, the gist of, of this work. Wow. What about there's real pain, right? There that you have to pay attention to. How do you like, what's the difference between that is such a good question. It's so funny. It's such a good question. Most people, right, when we we explain neuroplastic pain or or sometimes we see that when we go see the doctors and the doctors have done all kinds of physical tests, they can't figure out what's going on. Then the first thing we go to is, oh, my gosh, you know, they must think I'm the pains in my head. <laughs> I'm making this up I've or my pain that. is fake. That's yeah, right. <laughs> right. And so every pain is real. There's no such thing as fake and non-real. Okay. Every physical pain, it doesn't matter where it is in your body, whether it is in your head, 
whether you experience pain from your knee, your back, your hips, your skin, it does not matter, your jaw, your teeth, your eyes, all, all physical pain, no matter what the types, no matter what the diagnoses you have or the illness you might have, it's all produced in the brain, the same organ. Okay. It's all produced in your brain and it's processed through your nervous system. So it doesn't matter what's going on. It's the only way to resolve chronic pain is by addressing the brain because we know that that's where it's produced. Now, when it comes to acute pain, right? So for example, if you break a bone yes, or you sprain an ankle, well, that is a traumatic injury, in like acute injury that happens in your body. The pain is still produced in the brain, but what happens is the sensory nerves around your ankle or around the bone that will send a signal to your brain saying, hey, we really got an injury here. You got to tell the human to stop walking because it hurt, you know, so send pain. And that's the job of the brain. Okay, send immediate pain. This happens so quickly. And that's why you will get inflammation and pain and it hurts immediately. It's because the brain is trying to have you stop doing whatever you do so that it can heal. <laughs> I know I'm, I'm going through a knee injury right now. And um, I did rest it for a couple of days, but then I, I really wanted to exercise again. And it didn't hurt a lot, but now it's bugging me. So I can feel a little bit, I'm just like, oh God, now I'm going to have to rest again. I, I yeah. don't want to rest, but it's well, telling me, I think it's, it's telling me that I need to put my knee up, ice it and just, do that for how long has months. it been? Um, I what happened was I tripped mm -hmm. on in our neighborhood. We have these tree roots growing out of the sidewalk, so I had to contact the city after I tripped over it and fell. Oh. And it happened like today is what Tuesday, it happened last Saturday, so about nine days ago. Okay, it happened, and so I am I'm well, I'm it feels twisted. It feels a little, it doesn't, it's not really painful, but it feels twisted. And yeah. I think my kneecap is having, anyway, I didn't mean to go into all that. No, but. no, no. But I, you know, it's, this is, this is great. You bring this up because I, we see this all the time. And the thing is, again, with pain, even though you, let's say if you're able to walk and you know, it's, it's, you are able to walk, but you still experience pain it's still okay. So one of the biggest, biggest myths we have there is when we experience pain, we should rest. Right. Well, that's what I was told. And then I went to a different doctor. I've, I'm like determined to, to fix this. And he said, well, if you're, if you're not in pain, go ahead and walk. If it's in pain again, stop. But the other person said, just don't do anything for two days. And I'm like, but I thought that, you know, putting, you know, sending blood to the area by exercising yes. would help. No, it won't. So now I'm just, I'm going to get depressed if I can't work. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and I, I mean, I, I'm sorry you're going through this and it's, yeah. and it's so unfortunate and it's so common, believe it or not, that, you know, with our system. So here's the thing with our medical system, it's based on a, a biomedical model and which is very much all about when you have a problem in your body that is physical, the pain, we have to treat it and assess it physically, which is a completely different approach than mind-body medicine. Right, it so, is. And unfortunately, that's why a lot of people get conflicting messages, right? You'll get one per practitioner will tell you to do something and the other not to do something. At the end of the day, and this is why it's so important to understand the science of pain, is no matter what happens, like in your case, the, the pain was still produced in your brain, but it was sent to your knee, you yeah. might have tweaked it, but if you're able to walk it, I can pretty much guarantee you that there's nothing structurally wrong with it because you yeah. wouldn't be able to walk if you, if it had something structurally wrong with it. So the pain now you could still be experiencing, but it could also be because your brain might be picking up some messages from your thinking and your own emotions around the knee. If you have any fear of moving it or making it worse, your brain may pick that up as a message and make sure you don't make it worse by sending you more pain. Oh my gosh, like, what am I going to do? <laughs> it's a, You know what? I would say just keep walking, keep doing what you're doing <laughs> and n start noticing your reactions around the pain. When you get the pain, what's your reaction? What do you feel, right? If you're afraid of walking, 
because it might make it worse, just that fear could actually perpetuate it. So what if you knew right then and now that structurally there was nothing wrong with it? And I can pre, I mean, you're, you're over a week. So chances are, if you're able to walk and bend, there's nothing structurally wa- wrong yeah, with it. And, and when I sit still, I don't feel anything. And I just feel a little twisted. I don't yeah. feel like it's bad pain, but I'm thinking, I need to slow down. I shouldn't have gone on the bike for 40 minutes this morning, the stationary bike. And then I, I tried to get on the treadmill, but it kind of bugged me. Then I got on the elliptical, kind of bugged me. I said, okay, I'm just going to stop. And I thought, oh, I don't want to sit here for a couple of days with my knee up. I want to be out doing things. But yeah. I think you're fine to move. And and I yeah. mean, I know for us as athletic therapists, that's one of our biggest uh, protocol when it comes to injury recovery is usually after 24 hours or so, when if there was significant swelling, the key is to actually move. You want to move the body. You want that blood flow to keep going. And that is the best way to train your brain, it, you know, to believe that when you move, it's a good thing. It's not a bad thing, but you've been told different messages. So now your brain was believing one doctor saying, don't move. And then you're back, right. You're kind of flopping aside. Yeah. Like, yeah. And it's yeah. confusing and it creates a lot of frustration, which is, and so... I was pretty bruised mm-hmm. and now my bruise looks like it's gone. Um, and I didn't swell. Mm-hmm. But I I just pop one ibuprofen because I'm thinking because they said take ibuprofen. But I'm like, oh, I don't want to take anything. But I've been taking like one or two a day and one at a time. And I it feels like it's helped a little. I don't know if it's doing anything, but I thought, well, I gotta fix this. I'm supposed to yeah. go line dancing in a week. And I Oh well, I think I think you'd be fine. Yeah. <laughs> I honestly would just notice what you know, your reactions and your thoughts around it, but start moving. And when you do move and you get back on your bike, tell yourself, this is good. My knee needs it. My okay. knee, this is good for my knee, right? So you're reframing your thinking by saying things like that. Like okay. I, you know, my body loves moving. My it body sure loves biking. I am fixed. Like you're, you're creating these new beliefs in your brain so that your brain can just stop the pain. Okay. Well, thank you. Yeah, um, yeah. So when should we really pay attention to the pain? All the time. Like this okay. is, you know, when it comes to the mind body connection, again, some people will think, oh, you know, this is a new thing. It's a new fad or what have you. It is not. It is a connection between our mind and our body that has been there since God's created us. Yeah. <laughs> this is how a human being functions. So the problem is in our society today, in our culture, because of how busy we are, things are just constantly moving. We're constantly distracted. We get up, we pay attention to our phone. We look at our messages. We get up, we go. It is nonstop. And the problem is we don't take time to be still. Yes. And to sure. bring our attention to our body. So most people aren't aware at all with their sensations. They become so out of touch with their bodies that um, that connection is just fades away. It's always there, but the attention to it is not there. So going back to your question, every day, every day should be, you know, I'm a big advocate in taking five or 10 minutes a day where you sit quietly in a room, no distraction, no phones, no yeah. music, nothing. And you just close your eyes and you literally bring your attention to your body. I, there's a couple of meditations you can find. I mean, anywhere there's tons of them, really uh, YouTube, even uh, certain apps where. Yeah. I do the calm you, app every morning. Yeah. After I work out, that's my thing that I do next. I sit for 10 minutes. Wonderful. That's yeah. really good. And then you can scan your body starting from your head all the way down to your toes and pay attention to the sensations you're feeling. Yeah. That's a, you know, that's a great way to start. The more in tune you are with your body, the more you're going to have the ability to, to pay attention to those signals and to, to, to control them. Yeah. You're, Cause really that's what it is. You control them by talking to your brain, by rewiring your brain 
and saying, okay, I'm paying attention right now. And I know right now I need compassion and I know I need validation. And, and that is a simple example of what sometimes your body needs. It's just yeah. pay attention to me as opposed to everything else circumstantially or externally around you. Okay. Um, so I was going to ask this question before, maybe you answer a little bit. How can one identify whether their pain is neuroplastic or caused by structural or tissue damage? Yes. No, that's a fantastic question. Um, I'm going to keep it very simple. <clears throat> There's actually um, neuroplastic pain guidelines uh, that we can find online. It was created by Dr. Howard Schubiner and Dr. Alan Gordon. There's a couple of pioneers, you know, mind-body medicine doctors that have created this quite a few years ago. But the main rule of thumb here, and this is why I describe it, when it comes to acute pain or uh, pain that is caused by a structural injury, it usually happens immediately, meaning you need to have an actual uh, injury to your tissues. For example, you break a bone, you sprain an ankle, you fall, like there needs to be a mechanism of injury where you actually damage a tissue and that will create acute pain. Okay. Now, that being said, when, and I've seen this a lot of times in my practice too, depending on the reaction of the person around their trauma or around their pain. If let's say it was super scary and they're so afraid, they they feel, oh my gosh, I'm never going to heal or this is going to take forever. Right. That can prolong the pain and become neuroplastic, meaning that the tissues have healed, but the person still experiences pain in the same area for months later or okay. even years later. Oh, and they wow. still will blame that as an old injury. I've heard it so yes. many times, right? Oh, I've had back pain. It's because I played contact football when I was a kid and I still experienced pain. Well, that's all, those are all myths. It's not true. Really? Okay. Yes. So these are all neuro, it's, it's turn, it's become neuroplastic. So it's your brain that has developed neural pathways, thinking you're in danger and it will continuously sending you pain until you address the brain. So even abnormalities, and I like that we use the word abnormalities, when we get MRIs and x-rays that yes. diagnose herniated disc, for example, right. pinched nerve, osteoarthritis, uh, even when you see a, a, a joint that's degenerate, degenerating and it's like bone on bone, right? all of those do not cause pain. Really? Science have proven this numerous times. So because there's so many people that have these abnormalities in their bodies, but don't experience pain. Really? Yes. Like bone on bone? That yep. doesn't cause pain. No. Wow. It's the perception of it. It depends on, um, there's so many factors, but yes, science have has has shown this fact. So when sometimes we're such in a quest, right, to find out what is causing my pain, we're going to the doctor. Okay, you got to, I want an x-ray. Oh, no, can't find anything. Okay, well, now I want an MRI. <laughs> oh, can't find anything. Well, now there's got to be some <laughs> image that really goes deep into my body. There's got to be one tiny thing. And again, the intensity and the emotion that that creates by, by constantly wanting to find out what the problem is and how to fix it will perpetuate the pain. <laughs> I, I do that with everything. Yeah. I, I have to research it thoroughly. I have to go to many people. I need answers and it's and so, exhausting. It is exhausting. <laughs> and so what if I were to tell you that you had all of the physiological and neurological machinery in your body to heal itself? Interesting. I love that. So life-changing. So instead yeah. of constantly trying to find the solution externally, you go within. And I've had so many clients uh, and students in over the years that have resolved, you know, chronic knee pain and back pain where they've tried every conventional approach like yes. therapy, injection, surgery even, and things weren't working. And when they've tapped into their mind-body connection and have done the inner work, it, their pain's gone away completely. And there's enough scientific clinical trials and studies that have done the same thing. So it's so fascinating. 
It sure is. <laughs> um, I was looking at the guidelines on your website. Yes. Trying to go through everything I could yesterday. And you mentioned something about childhood adversity. Yes. The neuroplastic pain. Can you talk about that? Yes, absolutely. So um, I'm glad you, you mentioned about the my website or the neuroplastic pain guidelines are there. So um, childhood adversity is one of them uh, where they've discovered that anyone that that has experienced, whether it was physical, emotional trauma, um, but not, not only that, also, if let's say you were a child where you didn't move a lot, um, or you uh, grew up with parents that um, experience physical pain, and you remember hearing them complain about it a lot, yes. you know, suffer about it a lot, that actually can predispose you to experience similar chronic pain down the road. And the only reason is, and this is how powerful our subconscious mind is, is all of our memories, right? And these beliefs and what we see as childhood, they get stored in your subconscious and your subconscious is really the driving force as you become an adult. Yeah. So just that can kind of almost put an imprint in your subconscious that, Ooh, back, you know, the back is so fragile. I could really experience if let's say, for example, I've seen my mother, for example, you know, picking up grocery bags and throwing her back out every single time. Or, yeah, that's like my mom. She used yeah. To that back. And it's yeah. so common. You can associate your back being fragile and that any move can throw it off. So it creates fear in your subconscious. And that is enough to, as you get older, and you start experiencing stress, your brain will remember that and they can use that as a way of communicating with you where you experience back pain. So how do you make that not happen now? <laughs> so this is the work we do in my program. So it's really first becoming aware. And we have like I have some um, uh, childhood and adulthood stressor assessment questions really that yes that, that help you uncover this because a lot of times we just aren't aware until you're asked the question so you know if you're if, when you're asked these questions you're like oh yeah I do remember this in my childhood oh yeah I do remember this and so that pulls all of some of the limiting beliefs you might have around pain around health around you know illness and disease and when you become aware of those that's when we can do that transformation is to you know to understand once you really truly understand how your body functions and then you ask yourself well is hanging on to this belief really serving me is it yeah. helping me and then when your answer is no then you you have to just make a decision do you want to do I want to continue holding on to these beliefs that are right. not, not helping me and you let go and you create new beliefs and that's how you can completely transform your health and transform your life so it's self-awareness is key, but I've got all these tools to help you become aware of what's, what's going on. Very, yeah, it's very, very fascinating. And that's where, and, and these personality traits are also some of the guidelines for neuroplastic pain. Um, same, if you're noticing you have one day, you know, let's say you, you come, you commonly have back pain, but then one day can be on the right side and the next day it's on the left side and it tends to move around. Yeah. Some days, you know, you might be sitting and you're like, Oh, today's a good day. I don't feel pain. And then the next day, Oh my gosh, my pain, is, my back is killing me. <laughs> Those are all classic signs of neuroplastic pain. Very much so. And any pain that is more than six months has been considered neuroplastic pain. Really? Yes. Really? Yes. That's interesting. Our body, our tissues heal so well. And this is what people don't, you know, it's such a myth when they say, oh, I have a tear in my muscle and it's taking me a year to heal. That is a right. pure myth. It's not true. They really? heal so quickly. Yes, our body's amazing. We just don't give it, a, you know, credit. We really truly don't. And we're taught from a young age through our, our medical system right? That it's just, oh gosh, if you see some major wear and tear in your body, well, no wonder you're in pain. You're, you know, you're getting older, suck it up. You got to live in pain. That is so not true. Yes. I, I don't true, like hearing, right? well, you're older now, you're going to have more pain and you need to slow down. 
Yes. No, I don't. No. <laughs> what what a belief. That's so what? upsetting to hear. I know. And do we want to believe that? No. Like, you know, when you think of it as, as we get older, you want to be healthier. You want to be stronger. You want to feel stronger. You want to yes. feel like you're in control of your body. But because of the way our system is designed, it takes away that empowerment and that agency, right? Yes. Yes. We depend on doctors, on health professionals, on images, on medication, right. on surgeries to fix our body. Meanwhile, you have the power within you to heal, to truly heal. So I it's, love it. It's a decision and if the pain you just have to make. It's longer than six months. It's yes. neuroplastic pain. Most of them are. Yeah. Most of them are so, certain. So like what, like back issues that sometimes last a very long time. Back, yeah. it is probably, there is an epidemic of back pain. I mean, in yeah. North America it is so, so, so common. Um, and I can say with my 17 years of practice as an athletic therapist, and I remember I used to say that and believe that before I discovered this is, you know, oh, your core is weak. That's why you have back pain. You sit all day long. That's why you have back pain. Uh, or back pain can be hereditary. If your mom and dad had it, chances are you're going to have it. But we think it's a genetic, def you know, uh, deformity. <laughs> or even yeah. spinal um, deformity. So for example, scoliosis, yes. right? A curvature of the spine, having one leg longer than the other, having, um, isn't that common though, to have one leg longer? Uh, yeah. hundred I mean, percent. hundred percent. And it does not mean it's so bad. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so any physical abnormality, all of this for, when it comes to the spine or even like, I don't know how many times I've heard people say my, you know, someone told me that because I have flat feet, yes. it causes my back pain. Right. I do. Such a myth. It is really? so not true. <laughs> I love this. Yeah. Having bunions. That's another one that bunions are painful and it's not. So really? yes, all these abnormalities in your body are simply like gray hair in your hair. It's just part of the aging process. And it's, and this is where I so am a big advocate in trying to help people shift, shift their perspective on this. Yeah. What if having an abnormality was actually a beautiful thing? It just means you're, you're gracefully aging. It, it's yes. part of, you know, wisdom. That is it. But if we see it as it's, you're going downhill and it's only going to be, you're going to be experiencing pain all the time, then yeah, your body will, man it'll manifest in your body. Wow. So your body will achieve what your mind believes. So yes. powerful. So powerful. It truly manifests in your body. So do you combine this neuroplastic, what you do for the neuroplastic pain, mind, body, what role does diet and exercise, what role do diet and exercise play? Great question. So <clears throat> again, there's so many suggestions, advice on what to eat, what not to eat, what's healthy, what's not to eat, what's not healthy. I tr trust me, I've tried it all. I have now come to understand by doing all this research and doing this work is, so first it comes about your belief. If you believe eating wheat is a bad thing, then your body will make sure you don't eat it. Okay. Through a form of symptom. Okay. That's how simple it can be. Such as I was told eggs were the culprit of my migraines. So I was so in relief of it because I was like, Ooh, we found the cause. <laughs> right. And guess what happened? The placebo effect kicked in and it did lessen my migraines because I had such strong belief about it. Yeah. But eventually I realized, well, they, they still weren't a hundred percent gone because my nervous system was dysregulated. So your belief into what you think is healthy will impact your body. Now, that being said, um, we are as human beings, we're meant to eat whole foods, right? We're meant okay. to eat real vegetables, you know, whole foods, fruits, meat, whatever you but whole foods, I like to keep it as simple as that. So it's to make choices that you know, are still very, you know, uh, when I say organic, like just real, right? They're real. Right. They're not manufactured. They're not processed foods. So the more you eat that, the better for sure. But know. again, I was the super, I guess you could say label, uh, 
healthy at the time when I didn't eat. I was eating all gluten-free stuff, no wheats, no dairy, no eggs, and my health was still at its worst. Oh, wow. So, but because my nervous system was dysregulated and my beliefs were in the wrong, were not serving me at all. Yeah. So, yeah. So it's such a great question, but it all comes down to the basics of your beliefs as well. And exercise is good. Yes, Do we, that are, every day. we are designed to move. Yes. And I, so now I no longer use actually the word exercise because people will right away assume it's the gym, it's running, it's biking, it's weight oh. training. I yes, use the word fun for me. And that's totally, fun, but it's fine, right? It's whatever you love. So I use the word movement. Yes. You have to move every day. If it's walking, go do it. If it's Tai Chi, if it's yoga, whatever it is, move. But the important part is you got to love it. You want to like it because right. you do it with an intention of trying to fix your problem. That's <laughs> what that does. But right, yeah, that's it right. creates a, 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 an energy or an emotion that is coming from fear. Because if I don't do this, I'm going to experience pain. So I better do this. Or if I don't do this, I'm going to gain weight. So I better do right. this. Right. Yes. yes. So you're thinking, and I mean, you would understand that with the model, right? That we learn in oh, life yeah, coaching. Of so everybody, when you're in the action phase, all you think about is your A-line is what you got to do, what you can't do, but you don't pay attention to your thinking around it. Your results are not going to match. Yeah. I think you need to enjoy what you're doing too. I enjoy everything I do. I don't, I'm not doing it for any reason, except for the fact that it gives me energy and I enjoy it. I really do. And it's meditative to me. Yes, very much oh, so. Yeah. And so, and that regulates your nervous system. That's a great way of regulating your nervous system so that, so everything works well in your body and, you know, you, you feel more calm, your muscles get less tense. Yeah. So, and you, you experience it with your headaches at time. Most of the time when you do exercise, they do help, right? It's amazing that I can go in there. I've got a banger headache when I wake up. It doesn't happen often, but like if I don't open the window at night, it seems like the, the air is stagnant and my husband mm -hmm. and I both wake up with these headaches. So I just go in the other room. I'm like, I know I can get rid of this by exercising. Mm -hmm. And it, even though it hurts and I do every time it goes away. It goes away. Maybe so <laughs> right. So now you just include your beliefs and even about the the window being open. That's an yeah. interesting belief right there. What if it had yeah. nothing to do with the window? <laughs> it probably didn't. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so I would question that. Yes, movement, taking a de deep breath, so breath work, and just being still. Meditations, those are all great tools uh, in order to even express some of your emotions. If you're noticing you tend to bottle your emotions. Yeah. The emotions, is they're the vocabulary of your body. They reside in your body. So if you don't express them, and when I mean express, it's not like crying or screaming or yelling. <laughs> it's to allow the emotion to move in your body because really emotions are simply a vibration, right, that moves into your body. Yeah. And journaling is a great way to process an emotion, writing down what your thoughts are about things that could be bothering you, you know, and you know down. what I started reading or started, well, yeah, I'm reading it. I also got the audio, but that you probably heard of it now. What am, what's it called? All of a sudden my mind went blank. The artist's way. Mm. I don't know if you've ever read that. Mm -mm. I heard about it in some meditation class that I was taking and she wants you to do a morning it's called a morning, not a morning journal, morning writing or something. And you're supposed to write three pages by hand every morning. I, f I think it's called morning papers. Okay. And you're supposed to do it. I think she, I haven't read the whole thing yet. I'm not, I'm not even close, but I think she said it's a something you do for 12 weeks, do it every day. And you have wow. to write three pages every morning. Wow. Longhand, not type. Yeah. It. And yeah. I'm like, geez, I'm not used to writing. That's a lot. Yeah, <laughs> it is. So I did it. I started it this morning and I put on some meditative music and I, I did it. I, I did it. She even says you can write. I don't have anything to write about. I don't have anything to write about, but there was plenty. I did a full brain dump and just everything I could think of. And I did it. And I thought, hmm, I wonder if I could do this every day. That's a, and I thought, how long, when she says three pages, how big are the, 
<laughs> yeah, I know. These that were big so pages. I thought, oh my God, how am I going to get three pages? My hand's going to cramp up. And it yeah. did a little bit. So, but it's so helpful to do a brain dump every day. Just every to get day. It out of your head onto paper. Yeah. And that probably such helps a, a lot with, with what you're doing. Yeah. Oh, very much. And there's such uh, different ways of journaling techniques. Like the one you're doing is a great way. The brain dump is to kind of get everything out of your head. Often I'll do that. Let's say at nighttime, if I yes. notice I'm thinking a lot, I can't sleep. Yes. Instead of tossing a turn and getting frustrated, I will get up, put everything down, just dump everything on a paper. And then, yeah, it then really helps. Sleep. That's right. Yeah. But there's other ways. I love gratitude journaling. That oh, is yeah. probably the most powerful one, right? Yeah. Writing down what I'm grateful for. Uh, and it could be as simple as just, I'm grateful for my healthy body. I'm grateful for all the movements that my body can do. I'm grateful for, I'm grateful for the headaches that I get at times because it allows me to tap into my connection and it allows me to, to listen to my body. Notice how different that, that is. Yeah. Right? So that those are just some like examples of other, uh, and there's another one called journal speak. Um, there's a psychologist, of course, now I can't remember her name. Oh, anyways, she created that and it's a, it's great for childhood uh, adversity or childhood traumas. If there's any experiences you've, you've gone through that, you know, are really still raw. Uh, it's a technique to, again, put it out there on paper so that it allows you to process some emotions. I bet that would help a lot of people. Lots. It is one of them right? I use in my program. Yeah. Yeah. Very I helpful. I love that. Yes. And emotional processing is often something that people are scared of doing because we fear that if I get myself back into that situation in my head, I'm going to be stuck there again, right? I'm it's going to create, it. yeah, yeah, it's going to create these emotions that will traumatize me for life. And in fact, um, I've read that it takes 90 seconds to process an emotion. Oh, really? I know 90 That's seconds amazing. to process 90 seconds to allow it to go through your body. So when you see that that's all it is, 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 is a vibration you're feeling in your body right. and you need to just allow it, then it's not as scary. And when you do the work, you realize like the benefits are, are amazing for your health, but yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's kind of like grief, right? Yes. You have to process the grief. You can't just escape it because it'll mm -hmm. wait for you. It will do wait. Do people have pain because of grief? I just thought yes. of that right now. Grief, shame, blame, resentment. Um, those are really the common ones that we see. Though I had some of those emotions that were residing in my body that I didn't realize I was. Uh, but they were actually, and they weren't stemmed from childhood traumas. It was actually from <laughs> my personality traits. Of, oh. of how hard I was on myself and I was creating a lot of shame and blame that I was, I didn't realize I was doing. So my body was trying to tell me all the time, like, be kind to yourself. <laughs> That's pretty right. much what it was. So I, I had to become aware of that. And then I had to, uh, then I discovered what it felt in my body, where I felt it. Yeah. And then I was able to process it, to let it be. And then it completely shifted how my body was feeling. But yes, pain, physical pain can very much be, and most of the time is an expression of an emotional pain that you might be experiencing. Yeah. And you kind of have to pay attention also if you're, if you're around people mm. that are hard to be around and you have to listen to your body, like your does your stomach hurt when you're around them? You have to really listen to that. Yes. Pay attention to it, right? Yes, very much so. It's a great way to become self-aware. And 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 when you are um, in situations that you, let's say, have to be in, but you're not very comfortable in, and you're noticing that, and again, with becoming aware of your thinking, and because you you know, once the person understands that it's your thinking that's causing the emotion, then you can actually notice and then ask yourself, hmm, what am I thinking about this person? Or what am I thinking about the situation that's causing this emotion in me? Right. And then you can change it in the moment and completely yes. in one instant change how you feel in that moment. That's how yeah. powerful it is. And then yeah. later, maybe not spend so much time 
<laughs> with the, exactly. Have a time. Create have boundaries. A boundary. Yeah. <laughs> I know all about that, right? Yes. <laughs> um, so do you re recommend certain exercises or activities to your clients for managing pain at home to, or to make it stop, I guess? Yeah. Um, so physical exercise, you mean? Yeah. Or yeah, well, or, you know, or whatever kind. Yeah. So I, it's all I'm, so when it comes to physical pain, it's a hundred percent all, well, how can I say it? it's all mind body tools and practices that okay. really help the physical pain. Now, physical exercise is part of that as well. And that is the movement piece, because when you move your body, you enjoy what you do. It calms your nervous system. It relaxes your muscles and usually decreases your pain. Um, but it really comes down to uh, becoming aware, again, of some limiting beliefs you might have around the pain, around your you know, diagnoses or your future or your health, and then noticing what emotions these create. can, And if they are fear-based, that's what needs to change. So it's not so much, you know, and these tools help you become aware and they help you manage your pain okay. and resolve your pain. Okay. So you, you give people homework. Yes. In my it's program, not just they're doing the thing while they're on the call with you. They have to leave the call. And absolutely. So okay. my program is really, so it's a six month program. The one I have a group uh, program right now. And I also do one-on-one -on -one, depending okay. on what they, they prefer. Uh, but it's six months, this journey. And because again, it's not a quick fix. And, and this is something you got to be okay with, with it, but the, but it's all about inner work, but the ripple effect that this transformation does when you go through this process, it's not, not only it decreases your pain and your suffering, and you're going to create a, a, a sense of an agency and control over your body and empowerment. You're going to feel, you know, amazing coming out of there. It automatically impacts in a positive way, your relationships with others, your work, your relationship with yourself, um, everything in your life, because it's all about managing your thinking in order to create the emotions you want to live and the life you want to create. So we, we, we work on everything and that's part of it because when you've been experiencing pain your whole life, it's not one tool or one strategy well, no. or one word that will yeah, fix, we can it, fix right? it in a day. <laughs> no, exactly. So it's about doing that inner work, but I tell you, it is the most profound like it's changed my life and it's changed numerous of my clients as well. And in my opinion, that is priceless. And everybody deserves to feel amazing, to have, you know, a good quality of life and to, 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 um, age gracefully. Yes. You know, that's the biggest thing is, is we want to feel stronger as we get older. Yes. And, and be balanced, mm -hmm. a balanced life. Yes. Yeah. Very much so. And do you only treat adults with this type of thing or do you treat children too? Uh, I mostly focus with, with adults. Um, I have in the past have worked with teenagers, um, but it's, it's not really my specialty because teenagers brains are developed. They're not fully developed yet. So they're, but there's lots of coaches out there that, that have that, that skill set. Okay. Um, yeah. But myself personally in my program is designed for adults. Okay. And then does your type of therapy or coaching, can it be combined with other treatments? Yes. Great question. Okay. Uh, yes, it can. Okay. Um, I do help and support and guide the, um, the client in that process, because as we talked about earlier, when you're in physical therapy or treatment or what have you, you might get be told certain things that might not serve them in their transformation. So as long as, you know, they share with me what was told, what, what they were told that they needed to do or can't do. And then we kind of coach on that. We work on that to see, okay, well, is this belief really helping you or not? Uh, because, you know, otherwise it's just, it, it might slow down the healing process, especially if you continuously believe that your pain is caused by 
your hernia disc, for example, right? If you yeah. don't want to let go of that belief, well, then your brain's always going to send you the pain because it believes structurally there's something wrong with you. So if you're working with a physical therapist that's telling you, you need to do these exercises, and then people come to you and say, this is what my PT says, and I'm doing these exercises, then what do you do about that? You know, I educate them on the whole science of pain, like yeah. what are all the facts and, uh, and the gist of this work and the science behind my body medicine. And at, at some point, though, the client has to make that decision. If they're noticing it's too difficult for them to be to be in both, uh, they have to make a decision. And, okay. and you know, um, but again, I, it's very possible and I've done it where people continuously would get physical treatment, but it's all about they were changing their thinking yeah. when they went to therapy. For example, if you go get a massage because you're going there to fix your back, that won't help you. But if you reframe your thinking, you go there because it feels amazing, you want to relax, it's good for your body, that's a totally different intention. Interesting. Yeah. So, so that's where I fix. hope them reframe their thinking when they do I actually even have a cancer patient in my program you and do. so he continues on with his treatments nothing's changing but I'm helping him shift his mindset around his his treatments because again when we get hard treatments it can be it's very scary it's it very scary. scary yeah so and, and the fear can only perpetuate your symptoms so that's where I help and I provide that support is, okay, let's first figure out what are your thoughts and reactions and beliefs around all of this? And then are these helping you? What kind of emotions are they creating? If not, then, okay, we need to shift that. And that's, that's actually promoting healing. It's, it's only helping them to heal faster. And you could help them feel less fearful about yes. this type of thing, because that is very scary. It, it is very scary. And again, as we know, and as science has proven that fear is the emotion that will perpetuate pain and illness and disease in our body. So uh, when you realize uh, the more the empowerment really kicks in in you and you truly trust and have faith in your own body, then fear diminishes, stress diminishes you start feeling calmer, you start feeling excited, you start feeling like, yeah, more confident. I got this. I'm like, this is a no brainer. I know I'm healthy. Because it just it's a belief. I love it. Are there any recent success stories that you could share? Oh, yes. Lots of lots like of where, good where did ones. They start and now, now what, what, what are they like? <laughs> well, I've got, so I've got two that pops in my, my head right now. Um, one is a migraine. Um, and this woman is actually quite young. She's only 18, but she's a high oh, performance wow, athlete. Oh, wow. Really? Yeah. Oh. And she had migraines since, uh, I think it was the age of 14. Oh, and pretty significant oh and every day. God. Yeah. And she's a high, but that is the thing is the personality trait that was her triggers. She's a high achiever uh, because of she's a high level athlete, you know, she was hard on herself. There's a lot of, you know, um, coping mechanisms she had adopted. And that was putting a lot of pressure on her nervous system. And they caused a lot of migraines. So now we're at a point where she, I mean, I think she's down to one uh, migraine, I think every three, well, not every, but I would say once uh, every three weeks. And when she gets it, she can completely control it because now she goes within and it stops life-changing. Whereas before she was on, on drugs and, you know, oh. depending on, and, and attributing it to like her exercise and regime and whatnot. So that was a, that's a really good one. Um, and then the other would be um, a man, he's dear to my heart. He's such a, a wonderful man. He's an avid pickleball player in, in his seventies, early seventies. And he has bilateral knee replacements. Okay. And one day he experienced significant pain in one knee where there was visual swelling and redness, uh, oh. swelling and, and immobility. He couldn't walk. He had to walk on it, uh, with a cane. And it was excruciating. The pain was all day long. He went to the doctor, got x-rays, and it lasted a, a few weeks uh, to oh. over a month. They couldn't figure out the problem. Well, sure enough, 
It was neuroplastic. And uh, yeah, even, be- wait a minute. Even if they're swelling, yes, that can your make belief, you swell. Y- swelling can get created through belief. That's how powerful really? it is. Hundred percent. I mean, yeah. You see, it's red and swelling. Your thinking will impact your body at the cellular level. Oh my god! And it's all because <laughs> it impacts every system in your body: your immune system, your reproduction system your cellular system, like your genetics. That's how powerful our thinking is. Wow. Now tell me more about this. So for him, I can't wait to hear this. Yeah. So he was walking on a cane and there was, you know, clear evidence. He actually is in my town. So I saw him at the clinic. And when I did my assessment, uh, yeah, you could see he was in excruciating pain. There was no mobility and evident swelling. But because there was no mechanism of injury, because I asked him, I said, well, what happened? He's like, well, nothing happened. The pain just started. That's first sign. Okay. That's neuroplastic. Pain just doesn't start. You know what I mean? Like you need a mechanism to actually injure yourself. And so I, you know, I, I talked to him about neuroplastic pain and he was full on on board to doing the work. And for him within two weeks, he was back playing pickleball. No way. He decided in one instant to no longer believe that there was something structurally wrong with him. So then he decided and believed that it was his brain that was just sending him these false alarms, which is all real, but it was all false alarms. And when he started to implement the work I was giving him, and within two weeks, he threw the cane away and he was starting to play pickleball. And till this day, he, to this day, we actually went for coffee not long ago because he's, he just, Val, he says, Valerie, you don't understand that the, what you've taught me is not only to manage my pain but it's completely had this ripple effect in my life. I've never in my entire life have felt so happy, calm, and in control of my health. Wow. It's amazing. (laughs) What a story. You're going to get a lot of people that play pickleball contacting you. Yes. (laughs) I I can, I can, I can cure your pickleball pain. Exactly. (laughs) Wow. Football is a fun sport too. It is. Yeah. But now of course I'm afraid to do it because of the knee thing, but yeah. maybe it's all in my brain and I just need to tell myself that it's a good I mean, thing. I do tell myself I'm healing. I'm going to be, I'm going to feel better next week. I should say I'll feel better today. Now I am. And, and you know, this is the difference when we say I will, or I am becoming. Yeah. That is, that sets a tone of it's not happening right now. Right. Oh, so there's I still just need fear to say, I in am. that state I versus am. I am. Okay. Right. I am healthy. So what I teach people is you need to behave and think and act from your end result, whatever that is, whatever you envision yourself, what you're re- what you want your reality to be. If you want it to be health and you want it to be active and moving and That's strong, me. then yeah. you need to take action and think from that place. Okay. That's where the power is. Wow. Gosh, this is education. (laughs) I love this stuff. (laughs) This is great. Yeah. Uh, Let me see if I had any more questions. So what, well, I don't know if this is, you said it took two weeks. What is the normal amount of time for seeing when you see improvement? Yeah. So that's a great question. So it's so depending on the person, right? My program is six months. So, but at the end of the day, like everybody that goes through this, there will a hundred percent be some improvement, but what you put in is what you're going to come out of. Right. So if you, uh, don't do the exercises, you know, you don't do the, the inner work that needs to be done and you're not willing to feel uncomfortable and, you know, emotionally, and you're not willing to challenge your beliefs, then it's going to take you longer. So what if they sign up for six months and the, and the guy, like you're done for him? Well, we continued on, but so physically he was doing better, but we just, but because he had some personality traits that were triggering his pain Ah. then we work on that so it's not only the physical part i really incorporate like when we talked about boundaries right and boundaries emotional work um there's so many things in the that's part of the life coaching that incorporate in this because we want this to be sustainable so now he's at a point where you know when he'll experience shoulder pain 
he will go, he will talk to his, but he'll be like, oh, okay, I know what this is about. And he will literally talk to himself and be like, I'm feeling this pain because of this is emotionally what I'm feeling, or this is what I'm thinking. And he will, he's able to control his pain to that degree. This person just happened to truly adopt new beliefs so powerfully that that's why his work happened really quickly. So it's all about the, the intention you have yes. and the immediate beliefs you are willing to adopt. That's really what's going to determine how fast your recovery will be. I love it. <laughs> and so the, and the program that you do is online, right? Or yes, it's all or, through zoom. Okay. So you can be anywhere all in the zoom. world. That's what's so amazing. It's on zoom. Okay. Um, and uh, we meet, like I said, either one-on-one, -on -one, I have two offers or the group coaching. Okay. Um, and it's twice a week. So one of the weeks is the teachings where I teach the concepts. Cause the, you know, it's a paradigm shift. You yeah. really got to shift your way of thinking when it comes to this. So there's some, concepts you really got to learn and 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 adopt and i provide exercises whether it's it and it's all in inner work and then also mind body tools uh, and practices uh, so i have like a mind body toolkit that's available that they can go in and click on if let's say they want to do journaling it, it, it it's all guided so um it's very accessible and very easy I mean, it's, it's honestly a simple process. Yeah. It's just, it's, it's the inner work. Sometimes if you're not used to it, that can be a bit uncomfortable at first, but when you do it, yeah, oh, it's beautiful. It's the most beautiful thing. You really develop a, a relationship with yourself that you realize, wow, I wish I, I had done this before. It's exactly. So Isn't that what we all say? I wish I would yeah. have done this 20 years ago. I know. <laughs> Your program sounds rather robust, like there, and you create a lot of value for people. Yes, very much. It's called Rise Above Pain. That's the name of the Rise program. Above Pain. So tell us yes. where we can find you. So you can follow me on Instagram. Uh, if you are on Instagram, it's Valerie Mind Body Coach. I'm also on Facebook, Valerie Mind Body Coach, Mind Body Living. So my website is mindbodylivingrx.com. Okay. Okay. Um, all of my programs are listed on there. I do have the neuroplastic pain guidelines on there um, and lots of other resources, podcasts and books that I have read from pioneers of this work, the mind body medicine, if anyone wants to learn a bit more about it. Uh, but that would be the best way to reach me. Yeah, you have a lot going on on your website. And yes. a lot, oh boy, I couldn't believe it. I, this is fantastic. I see you're a Joe Dispenza fan. Well, he's one of them. Uh, he's one of the doctors. He was a kind well, his, I don't know if you heard of his healing story. It's pretty fascinating. Oh, yes. oh yes. I him. yeah. Oh, and so um, I really got to understand what meditation does at the cellular level. I like how he teaches it, right? He, he pulls a science and because of my background, I'm very much a science uh, Yes, uh, geek, I guess you could say. So I really uh, understand that. And he explains the placebo effect very well as well, which is our thinking, right? And we are the placebo effect, just most people aren't aware. Yes. And you read yeah. that book too. Yes. Yeah. Very good. <laughs> very I'm a, good. I'm a huge fan. So yeah, I saw that on there. Um, so is there anything I didn't ask you today that you'd like to share? think so I think it, I think we really covered a lot um I, yeah I would say the biggest thing I would encourage people is to start being curious about what if what if what they're experiencing right now can actually be healed and it can but it's to ask yourself that question like what am I willing to do here to experience you know a different life and to make decisions that are based, you know, that, that will, that will help you, uh, to create the life that you want. And that, um, you know, there's lots of myths out there. There's lots of myths when it comes to physical pain and yes, what causes it. Sounds it. Like it. <laughs> oh, it's, I mean, it's completely shifted. That's why I no longer practice as an athletic therapist and I don't treat anybody because it became to a point almost contradicting. Yes, um, that's right. Mm -hmm. And again, it's not to say like a physical therapist and, and medicine, it is very much needed. We need that. And I'm not downplaying the impact of how that has, what has created in our life. 
when it comes to emergency care, when it comes to acute trauma or anything where we need that help, it is very much needed. It's when it gets to chronic issues and when you get to a point where you have to rely on medication um, or, you know, management, quote unquote, that's where I just want to shine the light that there is a way out. There is a way out. You don't need to live with medication and, you know, believe that the rest of your life is is doomed with pain. Um, so I think that'd be my biggest message. There is a way out. I love this. People need to hear what you've got to say. They really do. Yes. Hence you, is my... You need to do a world tour. I know. <laughs> you know, I've got lots of dreams and 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 goals. So it is, uh, yeah, it, I, I definitely, it's one of my passion is to educate also uh, even health practitioners into this um, oh, yeah. concept because right? it's been around for so long. We just need to talk about it more. Yeah. Well, yeah. thank you so much for coming on today. That was so much fun and it was so great to meet you. And I hope we can talk again. So much fun. Thank you, Kim. I really appreciate it. It was an honor to be on your podcast. I'm so yeah. glad we met. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for coming. And um, I hope to talk to you soon. Sounds good. Thanks. Okay. Same here. Have a great day. You too. Okay. Bye. Bye.